Today I bring you a reaction to an interview with John and Julie Gottman on the diary of a CEO. John and Julie Gottman, if you don't know them, they are renowned researchers. I think Julie is a psychologist as well. And their concern is, is love. Not only love in the sense of how to make it better, but they do a lot of empirical research. A lot of stats are mentioned in this interview. I've got a bunch of notes here. We're not going to play the whole video either because I just think that's this is a two-hour um, interview. I think that it's going to be better to just mention the parts and even watch a couple of clips that really resonated with me, and we'll move on from there. So the first question that Stephen asked them, I thought, was really pertinent, which is, why love? And Julie gave a beautiful answer, but John's answer was particularly impactful to me, and I want to start us off there. Well, Bob and I started studying relationships because we were so incompetent at it. <laughs> and we, we were just two clueless guys going from one relationship disaster to another. That part really resonated with me because of my upbringing, because I didn't have many examples of good or bad relationships, right? I think a bad example is better than no example in many respects. And not knowing how to maneuver through the difficult parts of relationships let me tell you, I got really, really good at those first six months because I guess that's when the excitement is still there. That's when we all maintain our best selves. That's when you're still kind of facing someone's uh, human resource department and you're not as genuine. You haven't kind of let your guard down. You haven't really let someone in just yet. And after those six months is when a lot of relationships fell apart. And the ones that didn't, it almost felt like luck. It didn't feel like I did anything to maintain the relationship or I wasn't really cognizant as to why these relationships were going so well. But I knew after that I needed to improve. I knew that I needed to do something different to get a different result, to get a more sustainable result. And that's why I chose this path of really listening, learning as much as I can about this thing called love. I said this, I say this all the time. The strategies that our parents used are no longer viable for our generation. Some of them, yes, but this thing called social media, the internet has really changed it all. We've gone from having the people that we've known all our lives to that being a very small percentage of the people that we get to interact with. And with that, we don't know that the thousands of options that we may have on dating apps or even on social media like Instagram or Facebook. I'm not going to say many of those people aren't available, but we have a skewed perception as to just how many people we could actually potentially date. And then even fewer, how many are actually compatible with us. So I really resonated with John when he talked about just being incompetent, not knowing what your role is, not knowing how to start creating a little bit of regularity through your relationships because you found out who you are and what you're interested in bringing. So great answer, John. I thought incompetence is one of those most important things. They go on to talk about uh, social epidemiology and how there are certain groups, especially I think they focus mainly on the U.S., but there are certain groups in the U.S. who live longer than others. There are certain groups who have better connection. And the correlation between quality of life and the quality of your relationships. Esther Perel, I remember her saying this so well. She says, the quality of your life is directly related by the quality of your relationships. And there are cultures that really hold a relationship in high regard. There are cultures who create a sense of Belonging to each other. In the Sadia Khan interview, the sense of duty that some cultures still uphold is a real marker for how qualitative someone's life is, and it even contributes to longevity as well. But the parts, the first part that I really want to focus on is bids for connection. 
And I'm going to let the Gottmans explain exactly what that is. There was a big window in this apartment. Looking out the window and saying, oh my God, there's a beautiful bird in the tree. What does your partner do? This proved to be incredibly important. Does your partner either turn against you by saying, stop interrupting me, I'm trying to read, or ignore you completely, which is silence, not paying attention, or look out the window too and say, huh, cool. That's all it took to create a better friendship for a couple. And we found that the couples who were successful in the long haul turn towards each other's little bits for connection 85% of the time. The couples who ended up splitting up, unhappy, divorced, 33% of the time. So listen to that difference just between saying, uh-huh, and saying nothing. 85% of the time when your partner says something like, hey, look at this video or this reel or hey, what's that out the window or what color is this or any kind of attempt to connect is a bid for connection. And I really resonated with the fact that it doesn't work to turn away from your partner, at least much of the time, 85% of the time. The couples that both, you know, had a bid for connection answered in a positive way led to the health and led to a healthy and long relationship. I didn't have any problem with that, except, and again, I may be talking about my ignorance in this in this matter because of, you know, I guess lack of long term experiences. But I always wonder, wouldn't a bid for connection or the attempt be much higher or have a much better success rate if the bids for connection were in a way that the other party would be curious about as well. So in Julie's example, when she says, you know, one partner was looking out the window and the other part, you know, and made that bid for connection. What if one partner isn't interested in what's going on outside, right? What if one partner couldn't care less? What if one partner is deeply entrenched in John uses like a crossword puzzle, a video game, a show, a Twitter thread about ongoing rap beef. There's so many things that could be taking someone's attention away from their partner. And when that partner has that bid for connection, I wonder how successful it would be if the partner that is looking for a little bit of connection and attention can take the second to ask themselves, What is my partner interested in? Or what would make my partner respond to me with genuine curiosity and not just out of obligation? Because I think most of us that are in committed relationships, we want to know and we want to be, we want to have confirmation that our partner is actually doing it because of genuine interest versus obligation, many things at least. And so if you had a partner that was into color swatches, right? whether it be clothes, textiles, let's say textiles. And the one partner is asking for, is looking for a bid for connection. I wonder how much better a relationship could be if a partner goes, hmm, what can I do to get my partner's attention and to connect? Oh, I know that they like swatches and textiles. Hey, love, what do you think about the upholstery over there? Or what, what about this, you know, these colors on this, on these curtains? Or how do you see these two matching and things like that? Personally, I think that that would be a lot more effective. But I also know that that takes a little bit more effort on the person's part that wants, that's making that bid for connection. I think that little bit of effort can go such a long way in making sure they can garner their partner's attention in a very genuine way. And they can have a conversation that might be interesting to both of them. But having a partner say, hey, look at this outside of the window, that just feels a little impromptu, right? That feels a little, it doesn't, it it feels like off the cuff. It feels like there wasn't much effort when they're making that bid for connection. So they haven't mentioned anything like that in the rest of the interview, but that is something that I took away and I wondered how much better or how much more effective or how 
how can we keep that 85% acceptance or 85% in a response to a positive or to a bid for connection in a way that, you know, enhances the relationship for both partners. Later on in the interview, they speak about how Julie, when they, when her and John first started dating, she noticed that John would ignore some of her bids for connection. And she had to learn that he wasn't ignoring her. He was just hyper-focused. And that was because of his upbringing. Growing up in a very full household in a very busy city, New York City, he had to develop a sense of, of real focus and being able to tune out whatever could be distracting him from whatever he's working on at the time. Julie said, you know, I go into the living room and sit down and you don't even look up. And I sit there for a while and then I get up and leave and you haven't even noticed that I was there. So I was guilty of it too, turning away. And we worked on it. <laughs> we did work on it. The other thing too, though, with John, and I've, I've learned to accept this, right, over time, is that John grew up in a little teeny weeny apartment as a refugee in New York City. And it was loud and noisy and there were a lot of people all around. So he had to develop this incredible sense of concentration. And so <laughs> when I first met you, it was so funny, John. Um, I would be across the kitchen counter from John, he would be reading a book. He wouldn't even be on his computer. He'd be reading a book. And I would say, John, uh, John, hey, John. And I would wave my hand. And finally he would say, oh, yeah. I really <laughs> didn't hear it. <laughs> he didn't hear it. I mean, literally. And I had to understand that with that kind of concentration, he really didn't hear me. So once she's learned that, she was able to kind of adjust and give herself or give John the benefit of the doubt and give herself a second to feel, even if she feels that she's being ignored, she can feel it because feelings come. But how she processes that feeling in the moment, which probably takes less than a second, is a real tell. And I think that helps the longevity of a relationship as well. I really appreciate Stephen, the host, when he spoke about how his partner gave him positive feedback, which encouraged him to do what she liked more often. So she gave him positive feedback like, hey, I really like it after you finish a podcast, when you tell me how it went, or you told me, you know, your ideas and things like that about it. And that seems to be a bit for connection. And that seems to be something that he was interested in doing, right? She's asking him about a task that he's deeply passionate about, and she's just wanting to connect. So I think, and I could be wrong, but it doesn't really matter what the topic is for that bid for connection, as long as there is that connection being made. So he says he starts sending her voice notes. He starts letting her know how the podcast went. I think that's an excellent um, example of how effective it can be. Once one partner thinks about how to connect to the other partner in a very genuine way. And even if she's not interested in his podcast or whatever guests he has on, she's interested in connecting and he's interested in this topic. So by her using this topic, she can get what she wants. And that is, oh man, that's a recipe for the most beautiful relationship I would imagine. Or at least it bids for connection. The next part that I thought was deeply interesting was... When they spoke about the compatibility of dreams, do incompatible dreams break a relationship? Our dreams are not the same. They're very different. And sometimes I wonder, and I've wondered, and I think we've both wondered in my relationship, whether that is a big, big issue, if it matters. But why is it so important to express your dreams to your partner? And do, do they have to be aligned? Okay, number one, they don't have to be aligned. That's one of the big myths of all time. You have to be compatible. You have to have the same dreams, the same passions, the same interests. Wrong, wrong, wrong. That's not true. In fact, oftentimes we're attracted to people who are different from us. What happens when the dreams are in conflict, though? So if one partner's dream is to live in Australia and the other partner's dream is to live on, I don't know, America? You know... There are certain situations where one person's dream is the other person's nightmare. And there 
they really don't have a compromise that's possible. So the one you described, I had a couple like that, where she lived in Switzerland, he lived in Uganda. She had an autistic son, and that autistic son needed desperately a very good support system to help him cope with the differences that he lived with every day. So she wanted to stay in Switzerland. He worked for the government in Uganda. He was making a contribution there. He did not want to move to Switzerland. And she knew she wouldn't get the support for her son in Uganda. So they had incompatible, totally incompatible dreams, but there was no compromise here. So they ended up breaking up, but they knew why they were breaking up. And it was for good reason. That why, right? Never thought about it until I heard her say that in this, in this interview. But if you're going to break up, that's already rough. But having a why when it comes to the breakup, does that make it, does that feel better? Is that cathartic? Does that, does that help in any way? Comment below if that's something that you think helps you through breakups. If one person wants to live on an island in humid weather and the other person would rather live in the mountains in cold weather. If one person wants to get married and the other person doesn't. If one person wants to have children vehemently and the other person is absolutely dead set on not having children. Does that knowledge help the separation? I wonder about that. And to me, that was a fantastic point. Not all partners that you're compatible with have compatible dreams and aspirations for their lives. Oh, that, that must sting, right? That must sting to find somebody that you really, truly feel connected with. Somebody that you truly feel has the potential to enrich your life over the next 80 years or however long, you know, your, your lifespan would be. But one or two fundamental differences, religion, methods of raising children, if you both want to that, like I imagine these things feel too big to surmount together. And for that to be the reason for a breakup, yeah, it's a valid reason. But does it help? Let me know in the comments what you think. 